everyone. You're listening to the Health and Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Alison Mitchell, a practicing naturopath, and you can find me on naturopathnsw.com.au. These podcasts will feature discussions on various health conditions, health tips, and nutrition from a naturopathic perspective. Sometimes it's just me, sometimes I'm interviewing guests. All the time, I hope to share with you information on health and well-being with the aim to empower and educate. Please remember that all information is general and not a specific recommendation that replaces consulting with a practitioner. Please talk to your healthcare practitioner before undertaking any changes to your treatment regime. Imagine this scenario. You're a woman who has made the massive decision to get her breasts enhanced. Perhaps you've just had a few kids and after the ups and downs of breastfeeding, your once perky breasts are now somewhat deflated. Or perhaps you've always had small breasts and what with the current obsession of Western culture with big breasts, this really affected your self-esteem. Or perhaps you, like a surprisingly large amount of women, have asymmetric breasts and choose to get implants to even them out. Or perhaps you've had a mastectomy or a partial mastectomy and you choose to get implants to feel like yourself again. But then it's a few years later and all of a sudden you start to experience all of these symptoms that you just don't understand. Your tests come back normal and doctors can't explain it. You're losing your hair, you feel crazy tired, anxious, you're getting weird rashes, you get weird aches and pains and a whole host of other symptoms that just don't make sense. This experience is happening to a lot of women and sadly it's been going on for a fair while but there's very little awareness about it. It's called breast implant illness, a chronic and diverse type of sickness that's a result of breast implants. I think all of the reasons that women choose to get implants for are understandable. Personally I'm I'm still breastfeeding and I've sometimes thought about what the girls might look like when I stop but what they might change into and I've considered augmentation if there's something that I'm unhappy with but currently I just don't feel confident with the safety of the implants. It's not fair. Why is something like this put on the market and touted as being safe when it's really not? How much safety research went into this? Not enough. And why are so many women getting dismissed when they do talk about their concerns to their doctor's One, we shouldn't have so much pressure on us as women. Our boobs shouldn't define us. And two, there should have been so much more done to ensure that breast implants are safe. I think that the amount of different types of implants that we have gone through is a clue that the experimenting is happening on us continuously. We are guinea pigs and breast implant illness is the result. And this is something that's been going on for a long time, but we're only just starting to talk about it. I didn't know anything about this condition until recently. I knew that implants could go wrong in the form of rupture or migration, but not anything like this. We need to know more about it. So I've brought on the podcast today a naturopath who has gone through the journey of breast implant illness herself and is passionate about bringing this knowledge to people, educating women about what breast implant illness is, as well as what can be done about it. Alicia Habgood is a Sydney and online-based naturopath and yoga teacher. Her interest lies in autoimmune disease, namely gut, thyroid and rheumatoid arthritis, but her specific focus is on helping women overcome breast implant illness. Alicia's treatment encompasses not just the unique physical aspects of the disease, but the underlying psychological impacts of breast implant illness. Alicia is passionate about raising global awareness of this growing issue to both women and also to practitioners. I'm so excited to have you here, Alicia, to talk about this topic. I think it's going to be so exciting to get this information out to people. <laughs> Thanks, Alison. Yeah, I'm really excited too. This is um, something I really love talking about because, like you said, you know, awareness mm. is, is uh, really minimal, minimal on this topic. Yeah, for sure. So why don't we just get started with what is breast, il- breast implant illness? <laughs> Yeah, sure. So breast implant illness, uh, we can define it as a period of sickness that affects multiple systems within the body uh, and it's caused by silicon or saline breast implants. Uh, doesn't not, it's not necessarily one or the other and it's also not uh, dependent on if the implant is ruptured or not as well. So women experience breast implant illness with intact implants uh, with all types of implants. 
And the illness varies greatly from person to person. As a lot of us know, everyone's an individual. Um, so my symptoms could vary greatly to someone else's symptoms. Um, and, and it could be a list of two or three or 20. You know, it could be a laundry list. So they're quite vast and, and varied. Mm. So can you list some of the typical sim- symptoms that some women might experience? Yeah, sure. So uh, extreme or chronic fatigue, uh, dry mouth, uh, rashes, so urticaria, uh, hypothyroid, hypothyroid, weight gain, cognitive dysfunction, so memory loss or concentration issues, uh, anemia, constipation or any kind of IBS type of symptoms, um, any kind of sinus issues, postnasal drip sinusitis, um, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, uh, you know, constriction in the chest, um, uh, acne, dry skin, brittle nails, uh, exercise intolerance, painful joints, like fibromyalgia type of symptoms as well, so really bad, uh, you know, pain throughout the body, mm-hmm. musculoskeletal, metallic tastes, and ke- chemical sensitivity, so multiple chemical sensitivity, um, pins and needles, uh, numbness in your extremities, in the limbs. There's a lot of symptoms. Yeah. <laughs> really varied, as you can tell. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that makes it so tough as well because, you know, you go to your doctor and you complain about a lot of these sorts of – people would present their concerns about these symptoms and then, you know, you sort of get told, oh, like, we don't really know what's going on or the worst thing is then, you know, it's just your hormones or it's just stress. So these are the the typical symptoms that so many women get dismissed with as well. Mm. And that's that's a a big part of the problem with breast implant illness is because it's just not something recognised by mainstream. uh, Your GP is Mm. not going to sit there and consider breast implant illness. They're going to go, oh, you 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 probably just have a bit of anxiety, uh, you're a bit stressed with work or whatever's going on in your life blah 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 you know and yeah. and they'll run a few tests they'll do thyroid they'll do you know all the inflammatory markers things like that um you know whatever test they decide to, to run and half of the time it's either we get you know, false negatives or false positives uh, with with those testing so a lot of breast implant illness patients come up with no issues on their test results so the tests are all fine oh, all good you're, you're fine it's all in your head mm. uh, is what you know, some doctors will tell their patients unfortunately and these women walk away feeling really upset and frustrated and don't know what to do or where to turn and uh, that's a lot of the time it leads women after sometimes a short period of time sometimes a long period of time with chronic illness uh, down the path of maybe it is my breast implants maybe these are causing me an issue and then they start researching and lo and behold they find that there's thousands of other women also experiencing quite similar symptoms to them Mm. but what i would imagine is that you know we've been told for so long that you know these new silicon saline breast implants they're safe 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 so for so many people you know like they might be able to put that down to a time period like but they would dismiss it because they've been told it's safe yeah, that's that's an issue. Um, these implants, whilst we want to trust things like you know the FDA and all the, those authoritarian bodies, and, and that they've done all the research, that that we know that breast implants are safe. That's what we're told. That's what plastic surgeons will tell you. They'll run you through the, the surgery risks and complications, as as any surgery has, uh, infection and, and whatnot. But no one is going to tell you that there is a risk of developing all of these strange. Uh, autoimmune type symptoms and all you know all these all these issues that I've I've mentioned that can be experienced um, we're just not told and the research unfortunately is lacking when it comes to to breast implants Uh, it's only been in since about 2005 that um, the FDA and all those regulatory bodies they now require 10 year studies on breast implants before that uh, before 1991, there was no regulation on breast implants, and that's not fair. Yeah. That's not fair. 
Okay. I know. And uh, up until about 2003, there were only about studies uh, for about three years, periods, uh, mm -hmm. women. And there were only a handful of women that were followed and studied. So it wasn't like there was you know, 40,000 women studied for, for a three-year period. Um, a lot of people dropped out of these studies and, they, and, and a lot of it was done on reconstruction patients too, not even you know, your everyday uh, woman that wants to just enhance their breasts. So, mm. uh, yeah, unfortunately, the research really is lacking. There isn't a lot of long-term studies. And even with the 10-year studies, again, so many women drop out. So, you know, if they've just got a few thousand women doing these studies, can, can you really say that, oh, they're safe, oh, you know, these women may have developed a few symptoms, but no, we don't believe that they're linked. So it's it's just not the evidence is not reliable in my in my opinion. So when you say they're dropping out of the studies, do you mean that they're actually choosing to explant? Not necessarily, but they just no, they're no longer part of the the breast implant studies. So the main companies that are producing breast implants are Allegan and Mentor now, uh, and and you know every time they bring out a, a, a new product or a new implant, a new type of implant, then they're required to do studies. And these are now the, the ten year studies that they're having to to produce. But when women are dropping out of these studies, it's usually because they no longer want to want to participate. And I've heard rumours about um, if you do develop chronic illnesses and symptoms that a lot of the time they will exclude you from the symptoms, which makes mm. absolutely no sense. But uh, whether that's fact, I, I can't vouch for that. But I have read, I have heard that that is the case. Mm. Yeah. So that's totally skewed data in the case. Mm. But but that's that's ridiculous that the time period that they've been studied for is so short because uh, from the cases that you've read about and seen, what sort of time frame does it normally take for women to start experiencing symptoms? Well, that's the other thing as well. It's varied. So I experienced symptoms four months in to having my implants, mm. and I didn't put it down to my implants straight away because it, you know, like like everyone else i'm told you know, why that would you? Yeah. There's, no, there's no issues why would i be concerned about them about, yeah. about it being my implants uh some women don't develop illness and for five years for eight years for 10 years so it really does vary you know some women will be fine until their implants rupture some women uh, don't need to have their implants ruptured to have an issue yep yep and there are plenty of women, I'm sure, that have implants and have no major issues as well. But then that's the same with every type of um, infection or toxic issue er everywhere. Is that it's all to do with the person and, you know, your susceptibility as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And we find that, and like, like I said, you're right, there are plenty of women who are completely fine, have breast implants, no health issues, they feel great. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not as un it's not as common or uncommon as a lot of us think that breast implant illness, you know, it, it only happens to you know one in fifty thousand women. I really don't believe that it's that mm. that that's that smaller number because there's over 50,000 women just in one Facebook group alone that feel that they are sick and that's just the amount of women that have realized their implants I mean how many other women are out there that yes. really haven't put two and two together yet um yeah so it's um it's a bit sad really it's a yeah bit sad. for sure and I think going back to that that symptom list as well is because it's so big how are women going to really be able to attribute it to that when so, so many of those can be put down to other things and or just you know put off as stress so that's mm. tough we see that a lot of these women that are developing symptoms have some commonalities so some uh, we find that the susceptibility uh with women that have Poly, certain polymorphisms, uh, certain genotypes, so the HLA genotypes are more susceptible to having breast implant illness uh, and, and polymorphisms like, you know, comp issues, methylation, MTHFR, uh, GSTP1, all those, any kind of SNP that impairs detoxification pathways, phase one, phase two, methylation, all of those things, uh, anything that impairs that, we have a greater susceptibility to, to develop breast implant illness. And that is mostly due to the toxicity of breast implants. Mm. So the breast implants, they contain uh, a lot of toxins, a lot of heavy metals, 
uh, and uh, they're, they're very to to toxic substances, not just in the inside gel, uh, but also the outer shell, which is why the saline breast implants are not immune to having these issues. So, you know, they, they contain things like methyl ethyl ketone, which is a neurotoxin, a toluene, acetone, benzenes, uh, aluminium, aluminium, lead, mercury, platinum, rubber solvents. They're all inside breast implants. So <laughs> Yeah, they, but they say it's just silicon and saline. <laughs> Yeah, and that they're inert. You know, that there's, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. And and unfortunately, the breast implant manufacturers don't have to disclose the exact ingredients in the breast implants because it's patented, mm. so they can get away with saying, "Oh no, we don't need to d disclose that because you know, just in case someone steals our you know our, our product." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we don't even know for a fact the exact ingredients. So. There could be worse things in there that we don't know about. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much worse it can really get, but there could be, you know, other things. But these heavy metals, these toxins, they actually uh, can cause, you know, immune dysregulation. They can cause uh, toxicity problems that can lead to um, uh, viral infections, um, which is, you know, EBV is something I see linked to breast implant illness quite often, whether mm -hmm. it's an underlying uh, issue or it's uh, made us more susceptible to developing uh, viral infections as well. Yeah, that's interesting because EBV is so common, Epstein Barr virus, and so many people have that just, you know, earlier on and it lies dormant in our systems. But it seems to be that, you know, once our terrain is jeopardized, that's the issue. And so is, is it the case that the breast implants is putting this toxic load on our system, lowering our immunity, and therefore the virus can take hold? That is one of the main reasons, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and also that these viruses will, will feed on toxins. They will feed on heavy metals too. So if we've got an overload of those things in our system and our immune system is suppressed, then these viruses are going to take hold and they're right. going to proliferate and then you know then all these women end up explanting and still remaining sick and going well why am i still sick well a lot of the time we have to have to help the body you know clean up the body first mm -hmm. and fight these viral infections mm. well i definitely want to talk to you about the protocol of or what women can do but um i just what interested do you know how many women per year are getting implants in it's around 10,000 women in Australia every year. Yeah. So not a tiny number and it, it grows uh, all the time. In the US, it's about 30,000 a year. Is that the, the number in Australia, is that the surgeries done in Australia? Because I know a lot of people go overseas to get it done because it's cheaper. Um, that's mostly for in Australia, yeah, that yeah. number. So yeah. possibly even more than that, yeah. Yeah, it could be more and, you know, and that's not an exact figure, so. Mm. Could be but, more. Yeah, like you said, not insignificant. And then mm. we don't know how many people are actually experiencing breast implant illness because it's not known enough about and we don't have the data on it. But um, if we're seeing such an uh, increasing amount of people actually coming up and saying, oh, I'm not feeling well from it, then, you know, it's going to be quite a lot of people out there without, without a diagnosis, without an information for them there. Yeah. yeah. That's that's the biggest issue we see with mm. breast implant illness. So, how long um, do you think that? Like, when was the first time that you've ever heard a case of breast implant illness happen? How long has it been going on for? Um, well, look, breast implant illness has been going on since since Dow Corning started manufacturing breast implants, which was uh, the 1980s. So the 1980s to 1990s, that's when Dow Corning had that huge civil suit against them. They went into bankruptcy because they were sued by so many women uh, that experienced illness because of breast implants, their, their implants were found to rupture you know, more, more uh, often than other brands. So Dow Corning, um, that was a, that was a really big, and well-known and well-publicized uh, uh, issue with, with their implants and thousands and thousands of women sued Dow Coin. So was that a different type of implant that they were getting? Or was uh, that saline? Yeah, silicon breast implants, and that's when the FDA 
in the US, they, they took silicon breast implants off the market for quite a period of time and they were only allowed to uh, place saline breast implants into women. That's just in the US though, not in Australia. Right. Uh, because of that Dow Corning case, because that was an issue. Okay. And they were different, but, you know, different manufacturers, different products. I mean, we've seen the PIP implants they used. They didn't use a cosmetic grade of silicon. They used an industrial grade of silicon in their implants. And again, higher rupture rates, uh, complication rates from their implants. But I'm not saying that there's one implant that has issues and the others don't, because that is definitely not the case. I've seen women with all ranges of implants, whether that's the PIP, the French ones, the Dow Corning. I mean, they're not made anymore. Uh, if you had Dow Corning implants now, you'd have them for like over 30 years these days. So mm -hmm. um, that's not something that really is much of an issue now. Mm -hmm. the, the major implant manufacturers, Allegan and Mentor um, and they're the implants that we're seeing now uh, most commonly and the implants that have issues are all implants all types of implants yeah. then no implants are immune but we are seeing probably a, a greater or an increased risk of breast implant illness with these newer gummy bear textured yeah. implants um, for a, a number of reasons, but whether that's because they're more toxic than some of the other implants, some of the ingredients, uh, because these implants are meant to be like a Turkish delight consistency where they don't, if they rupture in the body, then they're not meant to leak and go to all the organs in your brain and mm -hmm. uh, all that sort of thing. So that they're meant to be safer. And that's what I was sold on with my surgeon. They're the implants I had. They're the ones that made me sick after four months. Uh, but that's not necessarily the implants that make women sick either. So everyone is susceptible, uh, potentially susceptible to getting breast implant Ill illness, whether that is a saline, silicon, allergen, mentor, PIP, whatever it is, it, it really isn't brand specific. Yep. So it like, doesn't seem to matter what it's made of. Some things are worse than others, but just the implants themselves are doing some sort of harm. Yeah. And it's really, really about immune dysregulation yeah. because the, the body is going, hang on, there's this foreign object in my body. What is this? Why is it here? This is not safe. It tries to wall it up. And we know that the body tries to do that and, and the body sees it as a foreign object and tries to attack it because it, it's a fact that every single woman develop a capsule around their implant. It's just like yes. a scar capsule. And a scar capsule, it, okay. Yeah, you know, whether you have breast implant illness or not, your body will make this scar tissue around your implants. Some women, uh, it's thicker than others. Some, you know, some it's really thin, like a like paper wafer thin. Some is really quite thick. So uh, the highest surgery complication, or the complication that mainstream will, will tell you about is capsule and contracture. And that is because the body makes this capsule and the women that have capsule and contracture, usually the body will then squeeze this implant together uh, causing a bit of pain because of the scar tissue and potentially a bit of deformity. So the breast then looks a bit uh, out of place. Uh, one sits a bit higher than the other, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it looks, looks a bit odd, right? But there are different grades of capsular contracture. Uh, so, you know, grades one to four, four being really bad and obvious from the outside. Uh, I had grade two, so mine was not obvious from the outside. It was just a little bit of pain on, um, around my chest wall. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the major uh, complication, I suppose, that, that the manufacturers try to mitigate by creating these textured breast implants. And they only have about a three to 5% reduction in capsular contracture on these textured implants. But these implants that are textured uh, are the ones that are implicated in the BIA ALCL, um, which is a type of lymphoma. Mm. So breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma that we're seeing now um, as of March 2017, the FDA issued a warning confirming that, that implants can cause this type of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. As well. That's crazy. And particularly for women who are trying to um, deal with the after effects of another type of cancer and then to go on and receive um, the thing that they're, they're getting, you know, they're getting cancer from the thing that they got, they got for the cancer. <laughs> Yeah, that was a jump, wasn't it? But you know what I mean. That's just it's not fair. 
No, it's really not. It's really not fair at all, especially these mastectomy patients that are sold on the idea of having breasts again and, and you know, get breast implants. And uh, it's something that I'm sure that they're really uh, happy and hopeful about, not looking disfigured um, mm. yeah, as, as much as they would without them. So, and then they go, oh, actually, there is a cancer risk associated. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, how do you... Yeah. How do you <laughs> So uh, apart from, we you know, you were talking before about the heavy metals being found in these things. Is there anything else being found in explanted implants? Uh, yeah, there is a risk of uh, biofilm uh, within the implant capsule. So that can mean that there is bacteria or fungal overgrowth within the implant, which are making some women sick. Mm. So, so, yeah, what's a biofilm for those that don't know? Well, a biofilm is, is something that will, it's, it's going to grow around the implant and it's basically something developed by the bacteria or the fungus that make it very hard for the body's defences or even antibiotics, anything, to penetrate this film and, and actually kill and attack this bacteria or fungus. So it's basically like a protection mechanism made by uh, these bugs, basically, that stop anything from getting in and and killing it Mm. and like biofilm exists in a few other situations so people might be familiar with it in a case of you know like like hip replacements and knee replacements where that sort of thing has happened Um, but also in sinuses and, and dental health as well so it's kind of like just the way all the more ways that bacteria and fungi can muck us around isn't it Exactly. And if this biofilm is living within the capsule of the implant, so that scar tissue I mentioned, Mm. then it is next to impossible for the body's defences to get in there and to to kill it off because you've got this this hard scar tissue around it. You know, how how can it penetrate through that scar tissue, let alone the biofilm as well? So the ability for antibiotics or anything else, any herbs or anything that we use that Mm. can usually kill off or help to kill kill off bacteria and viruses the fungus and viruses uh, makes it near impossible unless you were to explant and then you, hopefully the you know, the defenses are down and, and they can get in there yeah so that means that when they do have the explant done women um, they need to have the capsule taken out as well that's really important. So women that are considering taking their breast implants out, they have to make sure that they find a plastic surgeon that really one that is someone you feel is trustworthy or that will keep to their word because if you don't remove Im- implants end block, which means removing the implants with the scar capsule still intact around the implants, and if you leave that capsule inside, then you run the risk of remaining sick even when your implants are taken out so there's been quite a few women that weren't aware of this had the implants taken out just by the plastic surgeon to put them in didn't insist on having end block surgery and and then the plastic surgeon left the capsule in there because they said oh the body will will degrade it and the body will get rid of it over years it could be a couple could be 10 or 15 who knows but it's not a big deal but But you just have to be sick for that long you know you just have to be sick and if you know if it's got if you've got a virus bacteria viral fungal infections in there um even silicon if it it leaks or even the outside shell of the silicon it degrades It, it that's a fact it degrades and it can be left inside the body and then the body is still seeing it as a foreign object so you you still got this issue and the women are then having to have surgery again having the capsule removed so it's it's a pretty big deal to have have yeah and not every surgeon will do end block it's much more complicated it's more invasive it's far longer to far longer procedure to have done so you have to find a surgeon that says yes I do end block and has a track record and a history of doing them because it is a complicated procedure. If they screw it up, then they can puncture your chest wall, they can puncture your lung, uh, they can deform the muscle, your, your pec muscles. So it is it is an invasive procedure, but it's a really important one and really important for women to make sure that they have a plastic surgeon that 
they trust will do that, not just a capsulectomy as well, because there is a difference between end block and capsulectomy. So capsulectomy is where they remove the implant first and then they remove the scar scar capsule so that's not a good idea either because what can happen is when the surgeon removes the implant the the implant can rupture in that process and then it ruptures inside the body and then you have the possibility of silicon still being left inside the chest wall and the, and the cavity so this sticky gooey mess and you, know, you can watch these youtube videos and they're scary because you can see a plastic surgeon getting a cloth and shoving it into the the cavity and trying to get all the goo out of oh. the wall mm. so it's pretty pretty important to do end block yeah oh my god <laughs> <laughs> that would be so it would be so scary though like to have to make these decisions yeah, yeah. it is that's why it's really important to be fully uh, aware and informed when you're taking a your breast implants out uh, mm. i made sure i picked a surgeon that was quite popular on the breast implant illness groups that i know he's been practicing for a long time i know he does explant and what was really important for me is that he believed in breast implant illness that he didn't sit yes. there and go mm, no nah, i'll do it for you but i i don't believe that it's that it's real yeah. So that was important yeah because then you know he's going to do a more thorough job for you as well yeah 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 and my surgeon was fantastic it was amazing dr Ch david chin in brisbane i flew up from sydney to brisbane to see him uh i've recommended him to anyone he was such a fantastic surgeon and did a great job uh, did everything i asked took photos of him removing the implants and block mm -hmm. so i knew for a fact he did it uh, i was able to keep my breast implants which i requested just in case you know i just wanted to see that they were intact or what they look like or if i want to get them tested in future or whatever reason i wanted to keep them and uh he was like yeah no worries he he was a really really good surgeon that's awesome and really good that you were able to find that we, ha yeah. we haven't really um, talked about the start of your story, though, have we, um, in terms of how this started to become an issue for you as well? Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So about six years ago, I decided that I wanted to have breast implants. Uh, I was quite a different person back then, um, thankfully, <laughs> which is a good thing. Uh, I was far more worried about my looks and rather than over my health you know whilst i didn't know breast implant illness existed back then uh it was very important to me to have nicer looking breasts for confidence reasons and you know all the other reasons that you know why do women get breast implants in the first place you know i was just a typical another person another case of that um so i got these breast implants put in i went to a really reputable surgeon in sydney he cost you know a, decent amount of money it wasn't a cheap procedure by any means i didn't go to thailand which i get asked a lot you know oh did you you know have an infection no no complications no issues um everything was all great uh, he did a great job they looked great and i i liked them four months later i started to develop uh illness so i became really fatigued and i you know couldn't understand why I had many of those symptoms that I mentioned before. My thyroid became hyper. I ended up getting Graves' disease. I had chronic dehydration. I just felt like I couldn't drink enough water all the time, no matter how many liters I would consume. I just developed acne all over my forehead, which I'd never had in my life before. Um, I had numbness and tingling, so a bit of like neuralgia in my uh, arms and my legs, chronic sinusitis, post-nasal drip that didn't go away for the whole six years I had my implants, uh, musculoskeletal issues, really bad chronic pain in my shoulders, my neck. Um, I had bad joint pain, mostly all down my left side. So I had joint pain in my elbow, my left shoulder, my sacrum on the left side, my left knee. So it was all left-sided, which was strange. Mm. Uh, even in my joints and my fingers on the left side too. So uh, that was very, uh, quite unusual uh, for me. Uh, I developed a lot of these symptoms over a period of time. They didn't all just come four months after, but mo mostly the worst symptoms for me was the fatigue, the, the, the 
tingling and also cognitive issues I had. So I, I couldn't concentrate. I had terrible memory. Uh, I just couldn't remember anything and it really affected my work and everything I was doing. Uh, basically, I ended up not really uh, being able to work as much. I had to cut back my hours. I was just way too exhausted to do anything. Didn't really have a social life because uh, how, how do you have the energy to do work and social life when you have chronic fatigue? I went to every doctor, uh, every you know, GP specialist. I took I took drugs, I took steroids, I took antibiotics, I took, you name it, I, I did all the mainstream as well, then that didn't work, so I then found naturopath, I went to had acupuncture, TCM, practitioners, chiropractors, osteos, all the, basically, every, everyone, I, I went to them, uh, I tried everything, and my I did have improvement when I changed my diet significantly not that it was ever unhealthy before because it wasn't by any means I was quite a healthy girl I was always wanted to maintain my health and my looks and weight and whatnot so I didn't eat a lot of junk food I ate really well uh, I exercised almost every single day so I felt really good before and I had no health problems before mm. nothing chronic at all um, so I ended up Going to see an outpath, I started the Gerson therapy diet, so it was really extreme mm. vegan diet that I went on, drinking multiple vegetable juices every day, doing coffee enemas every day, really extreme stuff. And I started to get my energy back, but I, I was only about 50% to where I was before. Uh, I, I just didn't feel like my old self at all. And then in the last 12 months before I got my implants taken out, I came across breast implant illness online because I decided to do my own research and I found out all the symptoms and how I matched all these other women and I thought, okay, this only makes sense. So it, it took me about 12 months to make that decision and come to terms with having to take my implants mm -hmm. out because like a lot of other women, uh, you don't want it to be a breast implants. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't. <laughs> you you get these things for a reason, and you like them, and they look great. And I didn't really have, I had no complications, so why would I want to take them out? I I really hoped that it wasn't, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to try and get my health back on track and see what I can do for 12 months. It didn't work. I you know I couldn't. I I was starting to be an naturopath at that point as well, so I knew a lot about what to do, what not to do, what supplements are going to help me, blah blah blah. But it still didn't make a huge difference. Uh, and, and I ultimately knew, I just, I knew in the back of my head that I would maintain feeling okay and, and not ending up in a wheelchair and, and can't get out of bed. And I knew that I could maintain that by using diet and supplementation for the rest of my life if that's what I really wanted. But I decided that that's not what I wanted and I wanted to get my life back. So I decided I had to had to book in, have X plan done, and I'm over about four months, just over four months post-op now myself, mm. and so many of my symptoms have gone away already. I no longer have chronic like fibromyalgia type pain, musculoskeletal issues, so I don't really have that uh, any muscle pain anymore. My shoulders and neck, my joint pain is completely gone. Um, you know, that was debilitating because I ended up not really being able to practice yoga anymore or go for a run. None of those things I could do, and I'm a yoga teacher, so not being able to practice yeah. is uh, <laughs> very concerning for me. Uh, um, my joint pain was just too bad in order for me to mm -hmm. do that. So a lot of that's gone away. My my thyroid is no longer hyperactive anymore, so that's calmed down. My um, ANA, so antibodies, have significantly gone down since my implants have been taken out. So I've had a lot of improvement in my symptoms already, and my energy has improved significantly. I don't expect to be 100%. Uh, I reckon it will take about 12 months until 99% of my symptoms go away. But I have no regrets taking them out. I'm so glad that I did. Yeah. Oh, gosh. That would have been such a hard decision for you. I mean, yeah, I, 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 mentally it is. Yeah, and I mean, I can totally understand like a woman choosing to do that and um, to, to get them in the first place and then to have to go backwards from that. That would just be so tough. But, it is. 
Yeah. Yeah. I guess now that you 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 know that was the right decision for you because you've had your health improve so significantly, that would have made it a lot easier as well. Oh yeah, like, yeah, it is. And look, don't get me wrong. You know, post surgery, even though. I have a lot of mind-body practices and meditation and journaling and all these things that I've done to get my mental health to a really good place before and after surgery because I was very worried about my mental health and how I would feel having this, um, I suppose, type of body dysmorphia, I guess, when I was young and when I I felt the need to get breast implants because I wasn't good enough the way that I was. Uh, you know, ultimately, why why do we get them? Because, you know, we feel that we're not good enough the way we are. Uh, that's going to be what 99% of women out there do rather than some reconstruction. You know, um, why else would we get them other than a lack of self-love, really? Yeah. I, I, I did all these practices and still I um, had a really hard time for a couple of weeks following breast implants my implants being removed because it was a huge adjustment for me i went from having um nice large boobs which were not ridiculous by any means i were you know natural looking as i could be to having back to my small a cup boobs so it was a very big adjustment and i felt uh anxiety before surgery i had anxiety after i felt a little bit of depression a couple of weeks after uh, but you know a lot of that can also be attributed to the drugs and the anesthetic and everything that i had too so that's mm-hmm. all going to be detoxed out so i wouldn't be surprised if that contributed but this you know it wasn't an easy process just because i'm a yoga teacher and naturopath doesn't mean that uh i was you know completely fine post-surgery so that's something that um, does need to be addressed both by if you're a practitioner uh, trying to treat your patient with breast implant illness that you'll need to give support in that way as well because it is going to be a really difficult decision for people to have them taken out but just based on on that based on the the, the fear of what they're going to look like and um, the fear of how their mental health is going to be and so i think practitioners it's going to be an important part of, of helping patients overcome those things and also you know you're listening and uh, you do have breast implant illness or you worry that you do then uh, getting some help in, in that way getting some ways to, to work through those things are going to be really important mm. yeah such a good uh, uh, topic to address for that did you find that there was any particular tools that helped you the most I found being really aware of my thoughts. So every time I thought, oh, I'm not not attractive or they don't look nice or, uh, you know, because also after surgery, they're never going to look amazing (laughs) the week after surgery. They've gone through a lot of trauma, you know, so that's all going to go back into place. Uh, And just knowing, okay, this is not the way they're going to end up. They're going to settle down. Everything's going to be fine. And, uh, I'm, I'm going to have my health back. I'm going to feel great soon. Just basically trying to be uh, notice my thoughts, notice the negative thoughts that came up, writing them down, journaling, journaling about how I'm feeling, journaling about you know is this is this a real issue or is this an insecurity? Is this a fear coming up? Uh, what is it behind all of these things? These thoughts that are coming up. What, what is it that I need to heal? So that was important for me. Meditation, really important. Uh, I couldn't do yoga, obviously, just after surgery, but um, you know, before surgery and, and once you've recovered from surgery, I find yoga really helpful. Um, any kind of mind-body practices and, and techniques. But journaling was, was a really good one, I found. Uh, listening to any kind of inspirational and, and motivation motivational podcasts or talks or uh, anything to kind of get your spirits up a little bit uh, maybe even seeing a psychologist or a counselor or a spiritual healer if, if you're interested in that sort of thing whatever um is your own uh, so preference i suppose because you know not everyone's going to resonate and want to journal not everyone's going to want to meditate so finding something that you feel you resonate with is really important i believe that's good i'd love it if you could share some of your podcasts that you liked as well and we can maybe include that in the the blog post attached to this yeah sure i'd be happy to yeah that'd be great wow so what apart so we've that's the mental side of things and the self-esteem and self-love side of things how do we um, go about as practitioners and how can patients know how to support themselves physically going through this process you know in both um, women who choose to explant and also those who 
decide that they, they don't want to explant at the moment or even if those who aren't ready to do it at that time and place? Sure. Uh, well, there are a lot of nutrients that are depleted based on um, oxidative stress. The implants are a stressor on the body alone, so uh, a lot of nutrients can be depleted. So it's taking or doing a, doing a test to see maybe what nutrients are depleted, maybe what... Uh, metals are elevated so a lot of the common ones that you'll see will be magnesium zinc b vitamins selenium omega-3 and 6 and i also see quite commonly an increase in copper levels in in women with breast implants and uh, i find that that is because breast implants are a xenoestrogen really these um, there is a ingredient in the silicon which are uh, silicon or siloxane monomers and they are uh, estrogenic so xenoestrogens and they can cause um, our estrogen levels to rise which you'll find will need to be detoxed and we know copper can be elevated based on high levels of estrogen so I do see that quite commonly so that's usually something that uh, is good to take in order to, to detox to help the liver to detox any estrogen so uh, dim I like to use dim I find that works quite well uh, any of the indole carbonyls are quite good uh, anything to support the, the liver is going to be important. So any of the herbs such as milkfish, thistle, shizandra, um, uh, supplements such as N-acetol cysteine to help glutathione production, lipoic acid, taurine uh, for phase one and phase two, detoxification, all, all of those are quite important. Um, any kind of uh, lymphatic help. It is difficult whilst you have implants to do much with the lymphatic system because you will often find that breast implants do constrict the lymphatic system from flowing as, as they should. I had thermal imaging done a couple of months before I had my breast implants taken out and just the amount of constriction you can see through my lymphatic system, especially around my breast area, was out of control. The amount of inflammation, and it's that I had chronic inflammation so um trying to support the lymphatic system without making a patient feel really sick because when you're stimulating and pumping all those toxins around obviously a lot of women can feel a lot worse uh dry skin brushing is important any of the herbs that are going to stimulate the lymph calendula clivers um, and uh, infrared saunas are something that I've been doing post explant. I'm a bit dubious about whether it's a good idea to do them with implants because I worry that heating the body uh, even more can cause uh, leaching more toxins from the implants. So I, I do worry a little bit about recommending that whilst you have breast implants, but when you take them out, infrared saunas are a really important way to get some relief from symptoms you're experiencing and to help the body detox and you'll probably want to bind those toxins that are being released into the bloodstream as well so any kind of zero light purified zero light clays are, are quite good for binding those toxins um Immune modulation is always going to be important with breast implant illness, uh, any, especially if they've got ongoing viral issues, so assisting the, uh, the body with some, say, Romania, Echinacea, any herbs that are, are going to support the immune system. Thuja is, is a good one. St. John's for any of the envelope viruses. Um, gut is, is it always a big one. As we know, in naturopathy, gut, work is really important so uh, supporting the digestive system i know that oh, another symptom i didn't, didn't mention before but as soon as i had my breast implants taken out my gut was 50 times better mm. so i think the chronic inflammation in my body was just causing my gut to be so inflamed that no matter what i ate i had the worst bloating i had pain and i had really bad flatulence and that has significantly reduced by uh, just taking the implants out and I was taking gut powders I was eating an inflammatory diet before surgery all those sorts of things but just because I was in such a chronic state of inflammation it didn't matter what I did until I took my implants out. So you, those people that have a lot of multiple food sensitivities can possibly attribute it to a similar sort of thing going on? Yeah if you have breast implants and, and that's the yeah. case 
Definitely, definitely, because I was reacting to everything. <laughs> it was uh, pretty hard to eat anything and, and not go, oh, yeah, there's bloating again, and and there's that pain that I that I've got again. Um, you know, I was really limited to what I was eating before because I knew that so many things set me off. But it, it, in the last six months, it really didn't matter what I ate. I just had the worst bloating and flatulence. So did you find that all the symptoms that you had, did they get exponentially worse? Yeah, they did. In the last six months, they got worse, Uh, especially my joint pain. That was really, really bothering me. My fatigue was getting worse because I did get better for a period. And I think that was because I was really detoxing and and flushing everything out of my body and uh, helping my body in that aspect. But as soon as I stopped being so restrictive, uh, with my diet and trying to eat like a normal person and when I say normal a normal healthy person uh, <laughs> not standard you know American diet or you know, <laughs> not eating pizza every day or anything like that I was very very healthy still but I wasn't just eating a strict vegan diet and doing coffee enemas every day which is a bit ridiculous to do long term not necessarily uh, as soon as that I maintainable was... for people sorry I didn't hear you Alison I was just saying sorry it's not very maintainable for a lot of people <laughs> No, God, no. I mean, how can you socialize like that? You can't. You just have to not eat Mm. with your friends and family. And so, you know, it's not maintainable for a long period. It's really not. You'd you'd have to just uh, live inside and be a monk. It's not very exciting for many people. (laughs) But so so women who, if they're not ready to explain or they choose not to, they can do things to support themselves, but it's possibly something that they might find that they have to work really, really hard to do that and actually get to a level that they can enjoy their life or feel relatively symptom free. In which case, you know, it might come to a point where they do ultimately decide that they need to explant anyway. That's right. So look, you can go down the route of trying everything in order to to feel a little bit better, which I did. So I can understand why women would want to do that, completely understand. And unfortunately, you will find that you you just don't get back to that place that that you felt Mm. before. I haven't come across a single woman that has with their breast implants and said, oh, I've done these things and now I feel fantastic and there's no issues. I just just haven't. Not to say that that's not out there. It's going to be super, super rare. So you can do these things to feel a little bit better and they will make you feel a little bit better more often than not, but it'll usually be for a period of time and you'll go backwards or you'll have another flare up of some sort. Uh, And ultimately you'll find that women, you get, you get to a point where you're so sick of feeling sick all the time and feeling good for a week and then really bad again, that you'll just go, I just want these things out. I just, I just have to do it. So you'll find that, that people, they get to that point and I got to that point. So I understand it, it's, um, it's a process, but you'll find more often than not, that'll be the case. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, yeah, that's such, such an amazing amount of information for women that have breast implants and are experiencing illness that they don't understand why. Um, and so I think, you know, we could write a bit of a list of symptoms that are common that women experience to sort of say, oh, I've, I, understand, I have a few of those and maybe they can look through that and go, maybe it is an issue for me. Is there any way that they can potentially confirm it? Like, are there any tests that you found um, that can sort of lead them more towards that direction? There is, at the moment, there is no test that's, that it, I can go, go get this test done and you'll know 100%. There just doesn't exist. There's, there's nothing like that out there, unfortunately, because, because this is not something that is commonly known about. There's not much awareness, so there's no tel- test that has been developed, which I'm hoping in the future then it will be, but... Uh, just because of the complexity I'm I'm not sure Uh, at the moment if you are wanting to do tests based on your symptoms I mean these tests can be really varied depending on what uh, what's going on with you individually because like I said the symptoms are so vast varied so you'll 
probably want to do some kind of uh, gut testing, candida, bacteria, any kind of pathogens. Uh, I, would, I would probably test because when we have such a uh, dysregulated immune system, when our immune system isn't functioning the way it should, then all of these opportunistic bacteria and pathogens can take a hold of us. So you'll find candida and bacteria and all those, any kind of uh, issues uh, with infection wise uh, will we'll take over and there's a really common thing. Um, head tissue mineral analysis tests are good to find out if you have heavy metal toxicity or uh, an imbalance with you know with your minerals or uh, you know what's going on there that's always good to test so that you you know what minerals you actually do need. Uh, ANA, so the antibodies, see uh, if anything comes up there. CRP and ESR, so inflammatory markers. Um, any of the thyroid, uh, thyroid, uh, because you know, it is endocrine disrupting, so breast implants, so it's checking thyroid if you don't have any uh, imbalances there. EBV, CMV antibodies, so if you do have that underlying viral infection. Organic acids can be a good one to do to check you, know, you produce some good thion, um, and that'll also do a lot of the, the bacteria. Um, neurotransmitter because you know anxiety and depression are breast implant illness symptoms too mm. so uh mghfr any genetic testing so that you know if you do have those polymorphisms or snips that are common with breast implant illness patients if you do have any, have any of those and you know you need to okay we should take nac for this and uh take uh, taurine to help with this function or whatever it is, B vitamins, deflation, whatnot. So uh, those ones can be really useful to do. But one I also really find that I got a lot of benefit out of, and I know a lot of women have as well, is a thermal imaging or thermography. Uh, I mentioned that before that it gave me a really good snapshot to see that oh, wow, okay, I do have a lot of congestion around my lymphatic, around my breast area. It's all red. It's all inflamed, all under my armpits. Um, and I could, you could see the inflammation on the image, on the camera. Uh, so I was like, okay, yeah, this really correlates with how my body is feeling. So I'm feeling all of this restriction in my chest area. Or, you know, some even don't feel that restriction, but they still have a congested lymph in that area. So that gave me quite a, a good insight and, and a, a feeling of, okay, I know I'm doing the right thing by explanting because I know that there is constriction in my lymph in that area. Yeah, so that sounds like a good confirmation. And then all those other tests will give you a really good understanding of what else is going on to make you feel the way that you are from the, from the implants. Yeah, that's right. And unfortunately, like I said, there's just not one test I can say. Go do that and we'll, we'll you know, this, it's not like rheumatoid arthritis. Do you have rheumatoid factor? You know, it's, unfortunately, it isn't like that. So it's a bit of a guessing game. It's a bit of an investigation with breast implant illness, which is what it makes it tricky for practitioners to identify. So the most important question, if you are a practitioner, is to ask a patient, do you have breast implants? And even men, men are getting the surgery these days and men are getting implants, pec muscles, they're getting all sorts of things too. With this rise in plastic surgery, it's also important do you have uh, in any kind of medical implanted device? And I really wouldn't just ex just include breast implants in this issue. Any other, um, you know, knee replacement, hip, jo any joints, any anything that is a foreign object in the body has the uh, potential or the possibility of creating an immune dysregulation. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely be asking, you know, do you have any implant advices, whether you're male or female? I think that should be really important on the intake form. And then and also if you're a patient, uh, also bringing it to the practitioner's attention and awareness. So, okay, I've got these breast implants. So just make sure you know, you're mentioning that to your practitioner so that maybe they can go, oh, okay, that, that could be an issue. Yeah, yeah, that's re it's really important to know about. And hopefully, you know, with everything that you've been doing with all your interviews and you're spreading information and with this podcast as well, people are going to become more aware. So if anyone, I mean, anyone that's listening today or watching today, if they have anyone that they know that has implants, please t spread the information because we need to get that information out there. 
Yeah, we do. Yeah. We do. And the, it, it is becoming a little bit more uh, known about or talked about. There's been a lot in the media recently, a lot on uh, a lot of the news stations, uh, a lot of the uh, publications are interviewing women and printing their stories online and in, in lots of media outlets. So it is getting a bit more awareness. It is getting a bit more press, but it's still not enough because there's no, no changes. Um, the FDA are deciding to look into the safety of breast implants again. So they are reviewing it. I think it's based on the pressure that you know that they've received from from people and i know that there are plastic surgeons out there that are also doing their own research and study on breast implant illness i know my surgeon was looking into especially the cognitive issues so he was working uh, with some other people and doing that um there is surgeons in the u.s dr susan kolb and uh lu jane feng who are plastic surgeons that specialize in breast implant illness and remove breast implants that's their thing so there is there is becoming a bit more awareness there is uh, but it's still it's still not enough it's still not out there because plastic surgeons are still not warning their patients of this potential issue because they say well there's no research so why would they mention it yep that's the that's the thing isn't it and so just because there hasn't been the research done on it doesn't mean that it's not real Mm. Yeah. I mean, there is some research. It's just yeah. Yeah, it's it's not a lot, and it's you know it's not like there's fifty thousand women, and, and uh, it's it's just not quite to the standard that, that they would want. So it's it's not enough in, in the eyes of um, mainstream medicine to to say that this is a real issue. But I'm hoping that will change future. So the more awareness, but yeah. we have, the more people will start researching. So yeah, yay! More research, <laughs> more awareness. Yeah. Please, yes. <laughs> uh, so do you have a take-home message to women out there that have breast implant illness? Oh, yeah, look, breast implant illness is really tough. It's hard and you'll get a lot of resistance. You'll get a lot of people telling you you're crazy, uh, it doesn't exist. And really get some support from other women. Go and join the breast implant illness support groups. There's quite a few of them out there now. Uh, go and speak to other women and make it'll make you feel like you're not alone because a lot of the time you'll be feeling horrible and alone and wondering, you know, why, what's happening? No one's telling me what's wrong with me. And it's a really hard and difficult place to be in. I know because I've been there and the best thing to do is really get support and, and know all the facts, redo all the research, read all the information, all these groups they've got a lot of uh, information, the files part of the groups that talk about great searches to go to, um, any of the research has been done, all the evidence, all the stuff you need to know about you know, removing the capsule. And um, there's a lot of information on there that is important to read. So make sure you do your homework, read about everything to do with breast implant illness and stick to your guns on it too because you'll find a lot of resistance uh, when you, you know, you're speaking to doctors and surgeons about it. So just know what you want and make sure that you get that support and get that help and don't make the mistake of waiting years to explant when you find out about breast implant illness. If you're in a bad place, then all the supplements in the world are not going to do a whole lot for you. Really, the best thing to do is to explant. So try to be strong and support your mental health and do what you need to do to, to get better because it's really not worth uh, having these plastic objects just to, to look good when, you know, sitting at home by yourself anyway, not exactly uh, enjoying them. So, yeah, just get some support that's my main message yeah oh well that's an excellent message thank you thank you yes and, and thank you for everything today this has been wonderful and i'm really enlightened now about this topic because like a few months ago i'd never heard of it so i'm really hoping that we can sp spread the word thanks so, Alison. yeah you're welcome thank you um if oh, people want to get in contact with you what's the best way to do so so my website is alishahabgoodnaturopath.com. Uh, as you know, I, I 
you know, specialized breast implant, breast implant illness. So if you want to have a chat about how I can help you, uh, you know, prep before surgery and, and after surgery, then uh, I'm always happy to have a, have a chat and have a consultation. I also created a group only in the last couple of weeks, and it is a group on Facebook called Healing Breast Implant Illness Naturally. That group is not so much an awareness group because there's a lot of those out there and I, I don't you know, just want to be another one. It's more about the healing aspect. So what do we do to prep for surgery? What do we do after surgery? What, how can we heal? A lot of women uh, have not, not a huge amount of funds, especially when they're trying to you know, muster up $10,000 to explant. So anything that we can do naturally, even just diet uh, recommendations and I encourage everyone to, to post about what they found works for them. So it is a small group at the moment. I only just started it, but I encourage you to join that and then we can grow the group and bring some more awareness and, and help um, mm. other people that maybe can't afford to see a practitioner in the you know near future. Awesome. So we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Great. Wonderful. And so um, people can find me on naturopathnsw.com.au. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for listening. Please subscribe. Please leave a good review as well and share this with your friends, particularly anyone that you know that might be impacted by this. So thank you so much, Alita, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks. Bye, everyone.